Constructs such as academic self efficacy, academic self esteem, and um, academic related expectancy beliefs. So that's a bit of a broader uh, definition of self concept. Academic achievement, I'm talking about test scores and I'm talking about subject grades. And educational outcomes, I'm talking specifically about uh, behavioural outcomes associated with learning objectives. And when I'm talking about vulnerable young people, I'm using this definition of vulnerable young people. Young people at risk of not realising their potential to achieve positive outcomes in life, where the risk is shaped by underlying social dimensions based on social and economic conditions that generate these vulnerabilities. So just quickly, before I was here at IPI, I was living in Colombia, in Bogota, in Bogota, where that star is, which is in South America right here. And these are some of the young people that I was working with. So this is a group of girls who were in a workshop that I put on. And I'm going to talk about this girl here who we'll call Adriana for the sake of this presentation. Adriana is 13 years old. She lives in a very poor suburb of Medina, which is a city in Colombia. She's been taken away from her family at the moment. She's living for four months in a state-run institution with 40 other girls who are taken away from their parents because of sexual abuse in their family. And they go back to their families and their families have undergone some kind of program to remediate the issue. And then they come back to this institution. So they're in and out of institutions. Um, these girls do attend a local high school, which is around the corner. And as you can imagine, their attendance is a little bit flaky and their behaviour is a little bit difficult. This is a group of uh, Indigenous children, one of the many Indigenous groups in Colombia. It's, a, it's an informal preschool that was put together by one of the mums of one of these kids and subsequently they got some funding from the government. And these children, from a very young age, learn the craft of their parents, which is to make these amazingly detailed beaded necklaces, which they sell on the streets of Bogota for not much money. And some of these kids will go to high school. Uh, at the moment, they're, they're internally displaced people. So about 15 years ago, they were removed from their ancestral lands. And since then, they've been living in insecure housing in dangerous suburbs that are controlled by criminal gangs in Bogota. So, my question to everyone here is, who thinks that kids like these are going to not complete high school? Put up your hand if you think it's quite likely that these kids will probably not complete high school. <laughs> okay, so who thinks that if these kids have a positive, if they're thinking positively about their academic abilities, that's likely to help them, at least to a degree, finish high school. It's more likely they'll be more likely to finish. Put your hand up if you think that's true. 
Yeah, and actually the research suggests that it is true, that if they do have positive self-concept, they are more likely to finish high school. So who thinks that having positive self-concept, thinking positively about their academic beliefs, are likely to increase the chance of them finishing high school more or less than kids that have more supportive uh, social contexts. So put your hand up if you think that it's more likely that having positive self-concept is, is going to, on high school completion, compared to kids with more supportive backgrounds. If you think that it will make a bigger difference for these kids, I want you to have a think about that. Or if you think it will make less of a difference than these kids, compared to kids with more supportive backgrounds. Is that clear? Mm. I just want to make sure that's clear because I did kind of bullet that out in a way that was quite perhaps unclear. Is everyone clear on that point? So that is what we are thinking about here. That's what this PhD is really addressing. Whether the impact of thinking positively about their academic abilities is going to make more or less of an impact than it would for other kids that have got a more supportive social context. Okay, so just a quick overview of what I'm going to go through. What am I investigating? I'm investigating how important self-concept is for socially vulnerable groups in predicting high school completion. And in doing that, I'm going to be looking for what factors determine the degree to which academic self-concept influences high school completion. Why am I doing that? Because completing high school has been shown to be really important. If the impact of self-concept on school completion is different for vulnerable groups and non-vulnerable groups, then one or one size fits all policy and intervention approaches are probably not going to work as well as they could in tackling the issue of kids dropping out of school. And how do I intend to do this? I intend to do it through two studies. One is a systematic review that's going to synthesise the research, looking at the relation between academic self-concept and educational outcomes, and also um, a modelling exercise to determine the extent that the factors identified in study one, along with my personal interest in Indigenous uh, young people and low socioeconomic young people, um, act as moderators between academic self-concept and high school graduation, and, we're going to, and I will use the LSA data set to do that, and use two cohorts of that data set. So, there's been a lot of research on high school graduation that has shown that it is so important on basically any measure of life outcome you want to think of. High school graduates are happier, they are healthier, they live longer lives than those that don't graduate. They earn more money, they have less unemployment, and they make a bigger social contribution. Compared to our high school dropouts, who have the, the opposite of that. They have poorer health outcomes, they live shorter lives, they die younger, they earn less income, face more unemployment, they have less well-being, they make less social contribution through taxes, and they spend more time in jail, they have higher disability, they do more drugs. So high school dropout, as it is in Colombia, a problem. It is also a problem in Australia. And some of the issues associated with that are reflected across both societies. So now that I'm back in Australia, I'm going to look at some of these issues here. In Australia, the average dropout rate in 2012 was 12% of young Australians don't complete high school, and they never will complete high school. Um, this is compared to 35% of young Indigenous Australians, and compared to 40% of the lowest socioeconomic background. So, as you can see, there's quite a disparity between the national rate and these specific so what's my slice of the problem? So we don't fully understand the complex interplay of factors that predict whether or not a kid completes high school. 
And for us as a society to know what matters most, to guide our investment of resources and energies to get the outcomes that we desire, which is more kids completing high school successfully, we really need to understand how a particular factor, and in this case, self-concept, matters within the broader context within which it appears. And this is so society can take action where it matters most on this very important issue, and so vulnerable people have the best chance to graduate. So in terms of the research on high school completion, there's been a bit of an evolution. Cognitive factors have um, been prominent in the literature. Factors like academic achievement, the young person's academic abilities, their IQ, these kind of factors. More recently, there's been an emergence of non-cognitive factors, partly aligned with the positive psychology movement, um, and focusing on things such as aspirations, self-concept, utility value of education that people hold. Another thing that has emerged from the literature, that's become quite apparent, is that in this space of context, so the environment in which young people are embedded and how that influences high school completion, there are a lot of authors who have really started to voice that this area at the moment is underrepresented in research. So factors like socioeconomic status, indigenous status, locality, there's a whole lot of demographic background factors that in the area of educational psychology have not gained as much prominence as the number of quite a large number of authors uh, indicating that perhaps it should. So just a quick overview of the literature as it relates. So we know that academic achievement predicts whole bunch of educational outcomes, including high school completion. We also know, and that's part C, we also know that academic achievement predicts academic self-concept, and we know this very well. <laughs> we also know that it's a reciprocal causal relationship, so academic self-concept also predicts academic achievement. Uh, there's also been quite a lot of research in the area of educational outcomes, as the outcome variables, uh, that is academic achievement predicts high school uh, high school completion to a lesser extent, but there's quite a lot of research. Academic achievement predicts educational outcomes, and this is mediated by path B, the mediation path B, with the mediator academic self concept. So this for for educational outcomes, there's quite a lot of research there for different outcomes such as um, student engagement, course completion, university entry, um, educational attainment levels. I'm looking more at um, high school completion and so the literature that support that link is much smaller. The mediation link, the self-concept is the mediator is much smaller and it actually focuses on academic self-efficacy, which is under my umbrella of academic self-concept. And these are some of the articles that have shown that. Link. So that's just a bit of context. So self-concept is important for many educational outcomes. Some studies show it's important for high school graduation, but what are the factors that determine the degree to which self-concept influences successful school completion? Mm. I wonder. So, in my two studies, I'm going to do a snap review. The objectives of which are going to be to synthesize the research on this relation between academic self concept and educational outcomes and to identify the moderators of this relation. The research question for this study is what is the relation between academic self concept and educational outcomes? In terms of educational outcomes, I'm going to look at outcomes related to school completion. So, search terms will include, include school completion, school attendance, year level promotion, school engagement, educational attainment will be examples. And what are the factors that moderate the relation between academic self-concept and educational outcomes? 
The way I intend to do this is by going through our standard systematic review process. In very initial um, searches, using the search terms that I've just highlighted, uh, I've come up with 624 results. So that was looking at uh, title and abstract searches for uh, high school completion related outcomes, academic attainment, um, student engagement, grade retention, educational attainment, these type ones. And then also our self concept uh, search term equivalents. Uh, such as academic efficacy, um, academic self-esteem, and all of those things. So there's a variety of potential moderators, um, a few of them right there. And basically, we're just talking about the things that in, what enables or what constrains the young person's decision to continue in school. So that'll be really interesting to see what comes up. So I'll be looking at the moderators and I'll also be looking at what doesn't come up, what are the gaps. These are just two very quick slides looking at um, Indigenous status as a likely moderator. So um, this is obviously important because the dropout rate is really high for Indigenous Australians. There's a bit of research that shows that this is probably related to something to do with social capital and the differences in the way that Indigenous and non-Indigenous people see themselves in the world. The socioeconomic status, again, it is a problem in Australia for people from low, low SES backgrounds. And again, it is possibly due to the role of social capital being different between high and low SES. And then also the way that they perceive themselves in the world and how that affects their behaviour. So the outcomes of study one will be an enhanced understanding of this relation between academic self-concept and um, educational outcomes. And also a better idea of what the literature says the factors that moderate that relation are. And also an understanding of the gaps in the literature. So my study two is related to study one in that study one will ident identify moderators and gaps. And study two, I'm going to draw on that and also my interest um, in Indigenous and low socioeconomic background to look at the role of potential moderators, explore gaps through the modeling process. So, I'm going to do so uh, for study two, the objective is to determine the extent to which Indigenous status acts as a moderator and also determine the extent to which SES acts as a moderator. Research questions are Is the relation between academic self concept and school completion moderated by Indigenous status? And is the relation between academic self concept and school completion moderated by socioeconomic status? And of course, this is, these are my areas of interest, uh, depending on what comes out of um, the literature review. We can look at some other stuff as well and we can see how the literature review relates to these two and what other potential moderators come up with can explore that So study two, uh, as I've mentioned, is going to involve the Longitudinal Survey of Australian Youth. I'm going to focus on the 2003 and 2009 cohorts. Uh, it's a nationally representative database. Um, with quite large sample sizes, I think it's about 12,500, 14,500 participants in each of those two cohorts. The first wave of each of the cohorts um, has undertaken a PISA assessment. The measures that I intend to use are an academic self-concept measure. So there's a couple of those. There's a generic one compared to most other students in your year level, how well are you doing overall? And there's also domain specific versions of that question relating to maths, English, and science. Um, and then there's also some more polite self concept and self efficacy uh, 
domain specific measures as well. For socioeconomic status, I'm going to use the PZ index of economic, social, uh, social and cultural status, which is a measure of basically the status of the parents' uh, profession or their job, their highest level of education, and then uh, an assessment of items in the house, like the books they have and other wealth indication items. For academic achievement, it will be the PISA Academic Test Outcomes and Maths Reading and Science. There's um, Indigenous status is a question, are you Indigenous or not? And that will look at whether uh, participants know that they're Indigenous and are Indigenous or whether they don't know they're Indigenous or are not Indigenous. Uh, the analysis method is going to be using a moderated mediation framework, which I will outline shortly, and multivariate linear regression modeling using um, Barry and Keane's four step moderation test. So, there's some sampling bias, nutrition bias, and other biases that um, I'll be using the weights provided by LSA through their technical manuals to address. Uh, we'll run the initial model with the um, LSA 2003 cohort and then it will be validated hopefully in 2009. So, what we intend to test is this interaction here. So this is our mediation pathway where academic self-concept mediates in relation between academic achievement and high school completion. But what we really want to know is what influences the strength of that link. So what influences the strength of this part here between academic self-concept and high school completion. And so that's the mediation and that's the moderation effect right there. Um, and this is just expanding it again. So it's basically the same thing, but this time it's looking specifically at indigenous status as the potential moderator and the moderation influence on the mediation across the top and this is socioeconomic status as the moderator on the mediation influence across the top. So the outcomes of study two will give us an indication through effect size showing whether the moderated mediation interaction is occurring for prominent social and economic um, moderators dictated by study one including Indigenous status and SES. And so that's going to be uh, fantastic and fun and expand my R abilities. Um, and I am actually looking forward to doing that session and really good. And so just in summary, I've given a quick overview of what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do it again to refresh you as our lasting take-home messages. So what am I going to investigate? How important self-concept is for socially vulnerable groups in predicting high school completion? Why am I investigating it? Because actually completing high school is really important and as a society, we must take action where it matters most. Well, I actually feel like we have a moral obligation to take action where it matters most. And how am I going to do it through a systematic review and then through a multi multi period linear regression modeling exercise which I can just talk about. So thank you very much everyone um, and I do appreciate your attention. One of the real complications you're going to have to deal with is that uh, the self-concept is so much a function of the school average ability. And uh, so that uh, a low SES child in a disadvantaged school may have a high self-concept and uh, a, a, dis a low SES student in a uh, mixed ability will have a lower self-concept and that gets tricky in terms of how it fits in uh, uh, yeah. to, your, uh, to your hypothesis. I'm not saying it undermines it, yeah. uh, sure. but I and, and, uh, certainly uh, Phil and I have been doing a lot of work 
on, uh, on that transition. We don't even necessarily agree. I mean, we've gotten, uh, we've gotten, we're still talking to each other, but. <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, I actually completely agree because I've been trying to get my head around external internal frame of reference as it relates to this, or external frame of reference as it relates to this. And I, have, I have looked at that article that you both published in 2018, which shows that low SES kids compared to equally able kids in stratified schools have got higher self-concept. However, it doesn't translate to higher educational attainment levels, and that there's possibly something to do with the social context that they're in, which means that they have higher self-concept, but it also means that it does not translate to higher educational attainment. So, you know, I've had that there, and I've been trying to look at this through that lens going, so there's also some interesting issues about the self-efficacy versus the self-concept. Uh, and the self-efficacy measures are not necessarily well defined. Some of them are really more like self-concept measures, and so all these contextual effects uh, uh, are just as much uh, for them as they are. But others that are more pure self-efficacy measures are reasonably context-independent. Uh, okay. uh, I think the 2003 one as I recall, had one that I can't remember. Uh, a piece of different years has different self-efficacy measures, and at least one year they used one that was essentially the same as self-concept, and another one they used one that was uh, reasonably pure self-efficacy. So I'm not sure whether uh, they used the same measure in 2003 and 2009, do you remember? I think they did use the same one. Yeah, I think it's the... It was the 2001 um, yeah. where it was... How confident are you that you could solve the equation of y equals blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so that's a, possibly a way of finessing some of the contextual effects because uh, that measure is going to be much less contextually dependent. Mm -hmm. yes. It also may finesse some of what you want to look at because it's... I mean, the problem with that measure is it's, it's, uh, it says I can do this, but it doesn't say whether I think that's very good or not. It, it, it tries mm -hmm. to give a measure that doesn't have a value component to it, but it may be the value component that is the essence of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, so I've been thinking about these models a lot recently, and, and one of the ways I've been thinking about that moderated mediation model is through the capabilities approach, and the bit in particular is the conversion factors. And so the idea is, you know, say we have a, a, a poor community that are low on physical activity, we might create an intervention where we give everybody a bicycle. Mm. And we say, okay, well, now go get fit. And we don't take into account that they may not be able to convert that resource into an outcome because they're in a bike paths or mm -hmm. uh, is a dangerous environment or so on and so forth. And so what I've been really looking at is that link between self-concept and outcomes is kind of, if that is moderated, then what are the conversion factors? So, so what are the things that get in the way of that link? And I think that comes back to what Herb is saying around the, the contextual factors is that, you know, if, if you feel really good about yourself but you're in a school in which nobody completes or nobody goes on to university or whatever, you might translate that self-concept into an outcome in a different way. So maybe for you feeling really good about yourself in academic, meaning that, okay, well, I'm going to complete high school and I might be one of only 10% in my, and that's, yeah. you know, that's why I feel so fantastic about myself. Yeah. There's like a comparison if you're from a socially disadvantaged group, you know, you might compare yourself to people who are also socially disadvantaged you're better than them in your self-concept, but you're still not good enough to achieve university or, or to finish school, you know, like not yeah. as good as within your kind of group, you feel like you're at the top, but if you were comparing yourself to groups more broadly, perhaps you still don't think you're good enough to do whatever the socially normed things are, complete school, go to uni, etc. Yeah. yeah there's, like, there's like structural ones and then there's decision-making ones, and then yeah. that's the, the hard part of that differentiate. There's a great book called uh, did they jump or were they pushed? 
uh, by Diego Gambetta, is his name. Um, and that deals with that question in the framework that you're looking at is, are these kids dropping out of high school because of structural factors or because they're, yeah. they're following some sort of decision-making yeah. um, matrix? That, yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting that the decision-making approach, because I actually hadn't thought about it previous to that. I often felt that just conceptually that a kid would be pushed out of the system as opposed to them making a rational decision like, oh, I don't think I want to continue, so I won't. Mm. Or that the system kind of pushes them out without them making a conscious decision that that's not what they want. So it is interesting that decision making. I think in some socially disadvantaged groups, the decision, there's sort of, um, your decision is kind of, well, for, for all groups in general, I think the decision to finish school or go to uni is sort of assumed for you at a certain point. If you're from a particularly advantaged group or a particularly disadvantaged group, you kind of grow up expecting to go to uni. And in that case, the choice not to go would be a conscious choice. But I think for particularly people who are, you know, grow up in rural communities or as you, as you talked about, indigenous communities or low ICS low groups, I think the assumption is that they won't go to uni or finish school. Mm. And so doing it would be the choice. Yes. Yeah. I think that's true, but I think we can even push it as well to say that the decision for low SES and high SES is not the same decision. Mm. So pushing up the Get Better book, I think there's also John Gold talks stuff where he talks about risk aversion. And so what he says is that the rich kids uh, you don't really have a choice. Everybody expects you to go to university, and so that's what you do. And um, you know, if you want to be at the same kind of SES level that you're used to, you've got no choice. Mm. You have to go to university. Right, if right. you're a poor kid, then that mm. choice to to finish school or whatever is risky. You know, I could leave at year ten, go get a job, start earning the same money that my parents are earning, mm. and you know, be a, be ahead of the game. Mm. If I risk going through to year twelve and fail, and then I've missed out on my chance of an apprenticeship, then so I think they're also fundamentally different That's the only decisions. And also I think it's, it's heavy costs associated with it, that differentiation from your people, where mm. often that can be received quite negatively from family and friends, where like, oh, you think you're better than this sounds good. Yeah. And just practical as well. I mean, if you're at, on a farm and you're not going to contribute, you're going to leave, you're going to leave town to move away from the family. Um, that's obviously uh, finance could be dis financially disadvantageous for them and for their family. If you're uh, from an indigenous community, if you're a pioneer in some communities, if you're going to leave and move to the city, so that's a big thing for you to do. If you're going to not drop out of year 10 and get a job, um, then you're not going to be making any money for yourself or potentially for your family, depending on how it's structured. If you're going to go to uni, you're going to get $25,000 worth of debt that you're not entirely sure you'd be able to pay off. There's just a lot of practical considerations as well. I mean, part of what we're talking about is university. And yes. That's really quite a different I agree. Uh, From high school, comparable certainly. to the completion of high school. Because there's a lot more of a choice issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, there's a choice issue with the completion of high school as well. I'm not saying uh, that there isn't, but uh, it's less so than the decision of whether or not to go on to university. And you know, maybe you want to be looking at that as well. But I mean, on the other hand, that makes it too big. One of the early big yeah, so, But that depends on the historical context, right? And that's why I think it's important that you've got the 203 and the 209. So the 203 is before the rules that say you have to go to age 17. Mm -hmm. And so the decision is much more important in the 2003 yep. cohort than the 2009. Yep. Yep. But even then, it's not nearly as big a decision a choice point. But yes, I agree with what you're saying. Um, one of the early big fish little pond studies was that there was a, uh, a well-known finding in the U.S. that uh, uh, black Americans had higher academic self-concepts than they deserved to have, or some such sort of thing like that. And when we did the big fish little pond effect, we were able to show that uh, the black students had quite reasonable self-concepts relative to the school that they were in. And so their self-concepts were average because their achievements were average relative to the school that they were in, whereas if those same kids had been in some other uh, school. So I, I, I don't, I assume that, that would, there would be some relevance to that with the uh, uh, indigenous schools. Unfortunately, the PISA isn't very good yeah, uh, the uh, I don't know whether they've gotten better, but when I looked at it, uh, they only had a couple of the vast majority of the indigenous students 
were from just a couple of schools where they had uh, relatively high, and so it wasn't a, a, a representative sample of indigenous students that was nationally represented. Is that change? Uh, it's representative. It, that they reweight it to be represented, but it doesn't get at all of that sort of stuff. So what they do is they oversample schools with high indigenous populations. Uh, so it, it, it's about 3%, I think, of the LSA samples, and then it gets weighted down to about 2.5%. I guess the concern that I had when I looked at it was that there was only a relatively few schools. No, uh, there's, there's quite a lot now. But it, it, obviously, there's a few schools which have the majority mm -hmm. of students, but uh, I think that there's I think about half of the kids are in schools where they're the only, only Indigenous student or one of only a couple, well, well one of the 30. Yeah. But I have, I have no doubt, also, probably because I've seen the model, that this will hold and return interesting results. I think the, the really difficult thing you're going to have is you've had so many ideas of what that, what that moderation means and um, how to disentangle that and what that means and, and why is going to be the difficult bit. I mean, one of the issues also is that uh, your moderators aren't things that you can change. Mm, yes, absolutely. Uh, and Actually, that's part of, that is part of the point. And, and that's to respond to it. Policies, that's an intermediate. Yeah, yes, yes, but it, it would be nice if you had some things that you could manipulate to change things. Mm. Um, yeah, and that, and that is the um, optimist interventionalist in you, the most Also, if we consider, say, Aboriginality, for example, if yeah. they don't do well, it's not because they're Aboriginal, it's because they're, they're things are attached to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the interaction between them and their environment. So it's not it's Aboriginal, it's science. No, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, yes, but the interesting thing is, on that particular point, the interesting thing is where do we focus our attention and perhaps investing in individual level interventions and policies that are trying to improve the individual, maybe in some contexts it might be more valuable that we actually look at the big picture and how can we, at what point are we able to tinker on the bigger picture to get better outcomes. So it's, it requires actually a broad pushing back of the boundaries of some of these disciplines around educational psychology to encompass a broader contextual approach. By the same token, you're also pointing to policy level nuance. Mm. If you find that um, for that, that link, the, the mediation link is moderated by SES and Indigenous status such that those people don't benefit to the same degree by having their self-concept intervened on, increasing self-concept doesn't increase their school completion, for example then nationwide interventions to increase self-concept, to increase school completion are, aren't as effective mm. for those groups. So you're, you're pointing to policy nuance as well, how mm. if that's the case, if that's the result, we need to think about other ways, um, other yes. ways to get those people to complete school. Yes, because if otherwise... That's what we want to do. Yeah. Otherwise we're actually disadvantaging the really disadvantaged in that what we're putting in place to help them is helping them less than it's helping others that they yeah. need it less. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I suppose the what it is trying to do is trying to say, let's not set people up for failure. Where we say, you know, it's all on you, you can do it, you can do it, believe in yourself, and then when they don't, they're like, well, you should have believed in yourself. Yeah. You could have done it, you did it, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was asking, um, with the uh, dropout rate for Indigenous students, is that in control for four SES? So that's yeah. yes. Is it? Yeah. I think so. I thought no. it would be even more if it was low SES Indigenous people. Yeah, actually, it would be because it says the low SES here is forty percent. Mm. Um, so yes. It's a really so. tricky one, right? Because the sure. Indigenous population is so small in these samples mm -hmm. that. You control for SES and the indigenous effect disappears. Sure. But if you look at the effect size, they're still huge mm -hmm. just because they're so few indigenous. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. I mean, you end up, I think, with yours, I think, from memory, you, you've got somewhere in the vicinity around 300 to 500 kids that are indigenous in that sample. 
compared to 12 and a half, 13 and a half thousand yeah. uh, non-indigenous kids. And so yeah, you get what. <laughs> Any other questions? I was the one that's not about statistics for change. Sure. Uh, so on your systematic review, you wanted to look at moderate abilities, and you picked a couple ahead of time for Indigenous status and SES. Indigenous status is a strange one for systematic review, only because the literature that includes Indigenous is going to include Indigenous Canadians and Indigenous Americans. Are you interested in that, or are you just interested in? The yeah, study? I actually, I actually really am, particularly because of my international interest. Um, so I am interested internationally, and I would really like the findings of this study, even though it's going to be based on Australian data sets. Um, I'm interested in the potential applicability of that information for other in other countries. So. I presume some of it will be translatable or at least it'll be interesting to people in those different countries. So yes, I am more interested more broadly. Um, I, I, because I think that's really interesting, partially because um, you are going to run into the same problems here as we'll talk about in the second study, where indigenous status isn't going to be in every study, and so you're going to have a small number of studies in which to moderate that association. But also, indigenous status probably moderates differently based on country. So Australia has done a pretty poor job with its indigenous population, whereas you could argue places like New Zealand is probably going to have less of an effect. Uh, and even in some, like Canada, um, mm -hmm. might as well. So you might have this problem where you want to look at indigenous status, but it kind of all gets washed out together. Yes. Um, so for your purposes, if you can find Australian Indigenous studies, those ones will probably support your second study better than Indigenous as a capture of Would you suggest double coding those? You know, just a binary code, Indigenous yeah, versus non-Indigenous, and then coding within Indigenous? Yeah. 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 It'd be interesting, I mean, we could limit it to Indigenous as well. I mean, I think about, like, in Switzerland, we've got the, the French, German, and Italian cantons, and the Italian kids do markedly worse than the other two. Right. And, um, so looking at the you know multi nation states, well, would be interesting. I don't know how much of that there is. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Joseph, did you have any questions? Is it no. Oh, is it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let's, uh, <laughs> anything else? I think we're finished. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa.